Stay hungry, stay foolish. Unprecedented access to infinite solutions has led us to realize that having all the answers is not the answer. From innovation teams to creativity experts to crowdsourcing, we've turned from one source to another, spending endless cycles pursuing piecemeal solutions to each challenge we face. What if your organization had an effective and systematic approach to deal with any problem? To find better solutions, you need to first ask better questions. The questions you ask determine the solutions you'll see and which will remain hidden. Today's show contains the formulas to reframe any problem in multiple ways, using 25 lenses to help you gain different perspectives with visual examples and guidance. It contains everything you need to master any challenge. Apply just one of these lenses and you'll quickly discover better solutions. Apply all of them and you will be able to solve any problem in business and in life. We welcome author of Invisible Solutions, 25 Lenses that Reframe and Help Solve Difficult Business Problems, Stephen Shapiro. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. You start by telling us about your own story and particularly the existential crisis you faced with your lean consultancy work. You found yourself working in a destructive role rather than a creative one. It was one of these things, from my perspective, I was doing some really interesting work. It was back in the early 90s when business process re-engineering was a popular concept. And so the whole goal was to help companies become more efficient, uh, help them redesign their processes from end to end. Re-engineering became an excuse for downsizing. And so I would go into projects and the CEOs would announce that they were going to let hundreds, thousands, in one case, 10,000 people would lose their jobs because of the result of the work that we were doing. And I sort of had this existential meltdown where I realized, this isn't the work I want to do anymore. And so I had to look at a different path. Then the other thing you had, another lens through which you saw your new world was that you felt being a left brain process guy, you struggled with the chaos of innovation and needed to find order amidst that chaos. And I thought here of the Thomas Edison quote, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration, because we need left brained individuals as much as we need the right. Well, absolutely. I think there is this misconception that innovation is a right-brained creative endeavor, uh, and that is part of it, but it is equally a left-brained analytical process. And what's happened inside of organizations is they've confused what innovation really is, what the purpose of innovation is, and as a result, I think we're not taking full advantage of the people inside of our organizations. We're generating lots of ideas without very little value. We'll look at that towards the end of today's show because you give us all those frameworks which are beautiful and beautifully illustrated throughout the book. But before we go there, the word innovation itself, I know from calling this show the innovation show, it's one of the most overused, abused and misunderstood words in business today. And you say it's so pervasive and hyped that the organizational antibodies want to fight it. You know how this works. You go into a company and they say, hey, we're going to innovate. And all of a sudden, people start to react negatively towards it. I mean, it's not as though most people, uh, especially if you're talking about mid-level managers inside of an organization, they're in the mode of running the business, making it efficient, trying to hit the numbers for you know quarterly earnings or whatever it might be. And so you know, people reject innovation. But the problem is, it's not so much innovation is the problem. The problem is the misinterpretation of what innovation is. And from my perspective, innovation is not about novelty. It's not about being different. It's not about change for the sake of change. It actually is about relevance. It's about making your organization relevant in the minds of your clients, your consumers, your customers. Uh, Because if we don't adapt our organizations to stay relevant at some point, we're going to be in a position where we're out of business. And we see this all the time in any industry. I love the way you start the book. You tell us about the challenges and biases, et cetera, that get in the way. And one of those is past experiences. So if we find a way to solve something, that way becomes a shackle and it shackles us in our thinking. And you say problem solving can help us uncover better solutions. I would actually say in some respects, it's actually problem formulation because problem solving implies that we know what the right problem is. And I think what happens is our past experiences, as you just said, our past experiences often lead us down the path of believing what has worked in the past will work in the future. In financial services, they'll always say past success 
There's no guarantee of future success. And from my perspective, it's actually much worse than that. Past success is a pretty good predictor of future failure because what has happened for us in the past typically becomes the decisions we make in the future, but the world has changed and therefore they become irrelevant. So for me, this, this shift that we have to make is to make sure not just that we're solving problems because we all are problem solvers, but we're solving the right problems and we're solving them in the right way and we're taking the time to formulate the problems so we get the greatest bang for our buck. I love the research you share in the book here and you talk about the Max Planck Institute and that when we make assumptions, our brain reward system is activated. I thought this was really interesting from a neurophysical perspective. Yeah, the brain loves to be correct. And so what ends up happening is the brain has confirmation bias, which is basically what we believe to be true is what we see. And so we could receive evidence that's contrary to what is actually what we believe, but we will only see the parts of it that are consistent with what we believe. And so the brain gives us sort of this rush, like any time that it thinks that we got even a small percentage of it right. If we we're 99% wrong, but we we're 1% right, the brain is going to convince ourselves that we were 100% right. And that's why we end up making bad decisions is because, you know, we just because you knew your industry, knew your customers, knew your company, doesn't mean you know them. And so we need to just get past all these assumptions that we build around our businesses and our customers and our competition, because if we keep on living with those old models, which we tend to do because we're in survival mode, we're always going to be making bad decisions. So let's start zooming into the book. You break it into three sections. Section one is all about asking better questions. Two is the 25 lenses for reframing problems. And three is challenge-centered innovation. But let's start with the better questions. And there you talked about it defining the problem, essentially. And you say here, changing the questions you ask can uncover questions that were previously hidden from sight. And you give us the brilliant example of airplane baggage. This is one of my favorite examples, only because I travel a lot. So it's something which I deal with on a regular basis. And the, the, I'll tell the short, short version of the story is basically, you know, one of the airports here in the U.S. had their passengers complaining that it took too long for their bags to arrive at baggage claim. So they did some analysis and they found that it took on average uh, 15 to 20 minutes for the bags to get from baggage claim to the baggage carousel. So they decided to solve the problem. And again, everything is through the lens of the problem or the question is, how can we speed up the bags? How can we speed up the bags? And so they spent a ton of money on faster conveyor belts, more baggage handlers. They got it down from uh, 15 to 20 minutes down to eight to 10 minutes. Awesome. I mean, if you think about uh, if you were uh, in trying to improve uh, the wait time for any kind of service that you're offering and you cut it by 50%, you would probably declare success. The problem is when they ask the passengers, what now is your biggest complaint? They were still complaining about baggage claim and they realized that they couldn't make the bags go any faster without spending a lot more money because there's a point of diminishing returns in any investment. So what they decided to do and what they realized was is that at this airport, it took the bags eight to 10 minutes to get from the plane to the baggage carousel, but it only took the passengers one to three minutes to get from the plane to the baggage carousel. So instead of speeding up the bags, they decided to slow down the passengers and they literally reconfigured the airport so that it would take the passengers eight to 10 minutes to get the baggage claim. Their bags would be waiting and they were happy. And what I love about this example, there's lots of different ways we could slice this one. If we had more time, we could actually spend a whole hour just talking about this one example. Uh, <laughs> but look, if, if in business, we tend to spend all of our time trying to speed up bags because we think that's what the problem is. But what if there are other opportunities like reducing wait time? It's not the same as speed of the bags because wait time is made up of the speed of the bags and the speed of the passengers. Or what if we slow down the passengers? Or what if we change two words and it went from, you know, how do we reduce wait time to how do we improve the wait experience? Well, that's a completely different question. And now we're not looking at airports. We're looking at places like Universal Studios and Disney World who are masters at the wait experience. And so these we can change one or two words in a problem statement and have a completely different range of possible solutions and that's what we don't do is we don't take enough time to step back and ask am i asking the right question and in this world of change that's the thing to do isn't it and i love the ways for the listener the 25 lenses are clearly communicated and you can walk through any problem first to define the problem and then to look at possible solutions that you would not have thought of i absolutely love how you put the book together 
But one thing I thought was really interesting under the step known as problem definition is how you ask the question is really, really important. And when it comes to the word inquiry, I thought this was really interesting. The word inquiry spelt with an I is very different than the word enquiry spelt with an E because one is more asking in an accusatory way, such as the Spanish Inquisition or such as where were you last night at 3 a.m.? And then enquiry is more to draw out knowledge to understand the other side of the bridge, for example. I thought that was really interesting. But because of this, you talk about how you ask the question being ultra important. The questions we ask totally change the way we see the world. And look, I'm not saying that we need to take days, months and weeks and use the problem reframing as an excuse to not move forward. But the problem is we are we, we make decisions quickly and often we don't realize that and we move in a direction that might be the wrong direction. And it can be one word, one word in a problem statement can completely change the meaning of the problem, can completely change the way we see the problem, and it can change completely the range of solutions that we're going to develop. So we need to at least take a little bit of time to step back and just change the words, think about the words. I mean, some work that I uh, was done at NASA, they went from how do we get clothes clean to how do we keep clothes clean? That's just changing one word in the question. Yet when we get clothes clean, we're talking about cleaning after the fact, cleaning fluids. Whereas how do we keep clothes clean means preventatively, how do we prevent them from getting dirty in the first place, which means now it's a material science problem. That one word completely changed the range of solutions of that they would consider for the problem. This is where you talk about the brain does not like abstraction. So we need to train the brain and frame questions and challenges strategically. You played this out in the book about the Exxon Valdez tanker disaster, which spanned two decades, people looking for solutions. But then when they reframed the question, they came up with a solution in a very fast period of time. Yeah, I think this is a super powerful example. The story is in 1989, 10.8 million gallons of oil seeped into the icy waters of Prince William Sound in Alaska when the Exxon Valdez tanker crashed. And if you know what happened, they were trying to clean the water. And the problem was the temperatures were below freezing and it was in an enclosed area inside of a sound, which is basically land all around. And for nearly two decades, they were trying to clean the water. But every time they tried to extract the oil water mixture, it would freeze. So for nearly two decades, for nearly 20 years, uh, from 1989 to 2007, uh, they spent millions and millions and millions of dollars trying to solve the problem. How can we prevent an oil water mixture from freezing? And they didn't get a solution. Uh, and it was only 2007 when the Oil Spill Recovery Institute partnered with a crowdsourcing platform called Innocentive did they find a solution. And what was quickly discovered is that the problem actually had nothing to do with oil, water, or temperature. It was actually a common fluid dynamics issue called viscous shearing. And viscous shearing just basically means any dense liquid that's put under force or acceleration will act like a solid. Uh, and when the question was reframed to how do we prevent viscous shearing from happening, uh, a solution was found in six weeks it cost $20,000. The guy who provided the solution, John Davis, happened to work in the construction industry. And he was always working at how does he prevent cement chutes from clogging? And he realized that cement chutes clog, it's similar to the problem that was happening in Alaska. And so he had this little device that would vibrate the molecules. And so he took that device that he developed for cement chutes, brought it to Alaska, made some modifications to it, and he solved the two decade old problem. So it was in the reframing of the problem that the solution was found. And for nearly 20 years, they were asking the wrong question and therefore never got a solution. You mentioned earlier on changing one word can have a massive impact. And that may feel abstract to people, but this was proven in a great case study you give, which is of a custody case. I'd love if you shared this with our audience. Yeah, sure. So the study basically, you know, it was a scientific study. It's not a real world study. And what they did was they created this child custody case, the only child custody case, two parents, parent A, parent B. The way they would describe parent A was pretty vanilla, basically someone who had an average income, an average relationship with the child, pretty much average everything, average social life, uh, whereas parent B 
had some notable strengths and some notable weaknesses. So Parrot B actually financially was doing very well, but as a result, traveled a lot. Parrot B had a great, great relationship with the child, but was also busy, so didn't always get to spend as much time. So notable strengths and notable weaknesses. And so the researchers asked potential jurors which parent should be awarded custody. What ended up happening was in most cases, people decided to choose parent B. What's interesting is when they changed the question to which parent should not be awarded custody, most people said parent B, which means a parent A should actually be awarded custody. And what was happening was, is when you ask the question who should be awarded custody, the brain was looking for the positives. And when they looked at parent A, there wasn't a lot of positives or negatives, but parent B had a lot of positives. And so they decided to latch onto that person. Whereas when you asked who should not be awarded custody, the brain looks for the negatives. And in this case, parent B, in addition to the strengths, also had a number of negatives. They traveled a lot and they weren't around. Those one words, they so powerfully impact not just the solutions, but they impact decisions. They impact the people we work with. And we just don't take enough time to think about the power of the words, the questions, and the language that we use when we're having conversations, when we're trying to solve problems, or when we're trying to formulate problems. This, to me, is the most important step of the innovation process and the one we tend to get wrong. I think it's fair to say that we've framed the problem that we all encounter with innovation work. So let's look at how we can reframe any problem using the 25 lenses. And before we explore the lenses, and we won't get through, through them all by any stretch of the imagination, but how do we use them? Well, the first step in reframing is to, first of all, make sure you're asking the right question, because if solving the wrong question will never yield the right solution. So that's the first step is to make sure we're asking the right question, an important question, a question that's going to, to move the needle. And then we need to reframe it. And reframing it involves challenging our assumptions because we tend to make a lot of assumptions about the problems we're trying to solve. So we need to make sure that we've really looked at the problem and challenged those assumptions. And I find these 25 lenses are really a powerful way to challenge our assumptions. I think of the lenses sort of as like a mental kaleidoscope. But Mark Twain in the beginning of the book, I have a quote from him, and he basically says, basically, if we're trying to solve a problem, there's nothing new, but we're just sort of taking what's been there, those, as he described, the colored pieces of glass, and we just keep on turning them and twisting them until we see something we haven't seen before. And so these 25 lenses are that mental kaleidoscope, that way to take a problem and look at it from a slightly different angle. And there's 25 different ways to look at a problem. And what's really interesting is even though there's 25 different lenses, those 25 different lenses could yield 50 or 100 different reframes uh, if you take the time to do it, because each lens is so rich and so deep that you could actually take one question and reframe it multiple ways. It's so valuable for one of the key skills of the times we live in, which is critical thinking, even as an individual, but then for groups of people, bringing these lenses to them to look at existing problems totally reframes them and opens them up to new ways of thinking. I love the potential of this but you group them into five categories. Let's share those categories and then we'll get into each category separately. Sure, so uh, the first category uh, is to reduce abstraction. And what I mean by that is if something's big, broad and abstract, like how do I improve revenues or how do I improve productivity? Anytime we have those broad questions, they're not gonna yield very valuable solutions. So we need to break them down. So the first ones are all about uh, reducing abstraction. Uh, the second sets of lenses are all about increasing abstraction. So in situations where something's too specific, uh, the next ones are all around changing perspective, which means we're going to look at it from a slightly different angle, which might give us some insights. Another one is switching elements like the baggage claim. Instead of speeding up the bags, we slow down the passengers. And then the last uh, set of lenses are all around zeroing in to make sure we're actually uh, solving the right problem for the right business, because if we're solving the wrong problem, it doesn't matter. Let's start with the reducing abstraction. And the first one of these lenses is leverage. And you talk about using this to solve for the greatest impact. And I love the example you gave of a nonprofit organization innovating the education system, which seems like a massive task. Absolutely. So trying to solve the problem, how can we improve the education system is a big, broad problem. So trying to reduce the abstraction uh, is certainly a good place to start. And what's interesting is 
The first place we went to with this one is actually a different lens. So if you ask the question, uh, how do we improve the education system? One thing which becomes apparent is not only is it a broad question, but it's also a means to an end. So the result lens is actually where we started. And the result lens says, what's the outcome? What's the goal? Why are we doing this? And so the reason why we have an education system is actually to improve a child's learning. So we went from education system to child's learning. And then the next step is to uh, then break that down further. And we use the leverage lens. And so the way to improve a child's learning, they talk to scientists and, and researchers. And one of the things that was discovered is that the number one greatest impact on a child's learning is positive parental involvement. So the decision was made to solve for that problem. How do we get 100% positive parental involvement? Very different than the education system. And a solution was found in a matter of weeks in Bogota, Colombia with a very clever uh, solution. And, and the, the point is that you know if you try to solve the education system, you've got teachers, teachers pay, classroom size, infrastructure, technology, nutrition. I mean, there's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different factors that could be solved. And trying to solve that big problem yields a lot of wasted energy. Then the next one you talk about is to deconstruct. And this is where we break things into smaller parts. And you give the example of a hotel trying to improve the guest experience. I love this one. If a hotel is trying to improve the guest experience, there's, and the way it started off was they just asked, how do we do that? And you get hundreds and thousands of different ideas and most are low value. And one of the things which they realized, well, let's break it down, break it down. And the whole deconstruct lens, the deconstruct lens basically said, what are the parts? Parts could literally be parts, like parts of a car. They could be parts of your customer's market, so segments, or it could be steps of a process. So in this case, it was deconstructed down into steps. Well, what happens? So somebody goes online and they reserve a room and then they get to the hotel and they check in, they stay at the hotel, they have room service, they have all the other things that go along with them, they check out. What they realized is that for them, the first experience and the last experience might be the most important. The check-in and the check-out were very important. So they spent a lot of time and money trying to perfect the check-in, check-out process, as opposed to trying to deal with every other single checkpoint or every other point in the process. Those were the two. So when they deconstructed it, they started to see where could we focus our energies that might have the greatest impact. So the next one then, lens three of this section is reduce. And this is where we either drop exp expectations, we simplify. And this one's so important. You say that we should use this when stretch targets and complexity are not producing the desired results. And you give the example of a sports manufacturer setting a sales target to be achieved at all costs. And that can be dangerous because it can really sway behavior. Yeah, we have stretch goals and there's a reason for stretch goals, but stretch goals also can at times create behaviors that are not consistent with what we want because people then do anything and everything to optimize the goal around the goal rather than what's best for the company. And I, I think it's just important to sort of step back just for a moment to say that stretch goals are great, very powerful during the innovation process because it shifts the way you think and the way you see the world. But if you use stretch goals too much, it actually creates these dysfunctional behaviors. And so this one company, uh, sporting goods company was at an event and they said, you have to sell $1 million of product. That's the goal. You're not leaving this event until you sell $1 million. And they sold $900,000 of product quickly, easily. I mean, it was like just printing money. But that last $100,000 proved so difficult. But because the goal was $1 million, they actually ended up losing so much money on that last $100,000 to hit the million dollars in sales that it impacted profitability. So they hit one number, but they negatively impacted another number. And so we just need to recognize that anytime we're working on something, it's not necessarily the best thing to increase complexity or increase the numbers. And another perspective, which I love, is a quote from the author of The Little Prince who said, perfection's not attained when there's no longer anything to add, but when there's no longer anything left to remove. And I think that's brilliant because we are so focused on what do we add? What do we add? How do we get bigger? How do we get better? But to me, sometimes simplification is the best innovation. How do we step back and actually say, what do I remove from this particular situation? How do I make it simpler so it's more accessible, that more people can use it? And there's just so many fantastic examples of that. 
A great example you give to bring this one to life is the Nintendo Wii system. Go back to 2008, Nintendo, unlike PlayStation, decided to, instead of increasing the quality of the graphics and increasing the sophistication, increasing the power machines, they decided to make rudimentary and crude graphics. They made it accessible. And the Nintendo Wii was basically designed to be used by anybody from eight years old to 80 years old by changing the interface. And what's amazing is the in the year of the launch of the Nintendo Wii, they sold more than Xbox and PlayStation combined because of that accessibility. Uh, others caught on. They started to improve their interfaces the same way in terms of making it easier for people to use. And what's interesting now is if you look at it, most of the money in gaming is actually mobile games on your phone. So if you look at your phone right now and all the games that you have on there, that's where a lot of the money is being made. Well, those are super simple user interfaces. They've made it as accessible as possible. So sometimes accessibility is the best innovation because more people can use it. Tightly linked to this one is the next lens, which is eliminate. And I often think about this, for example, in the airline industry, getting rid of baggage fees for carry-on luggage, for example, is really, really difficult. It's really difficult for businesses to let go of clunky experiences where they make money. And you talk about this lens of getting rid of it, and you give the brilliant example of self-cannibalization or self-disruption from the tobacco industry. You know, the tobacco industry, controversial industry for, from a, for a number of reasons, but one of the things which I thought really was quite fascinating, quite bold, was uh, Philip Morris International decided that uh, they publicly stated, they publicly stated that uh, in the future, I don't think there was a specific date set, but in the future, they will eliminate cigarettes from their portfolio. Now, if you think about a company like that, you know, I think it was 98% of their revenues are coming from cigarettes. So they spent so much money. It was about $2.5 billion uh, de developing a device called ICOS. And an ICOS is a, uh, a device I've had a chance to see it. I've been actually in a room with a couple hundred people using it and you couldn't even smell smoke, but it, it is burning tobacco. So it's not eliminating tobacco, but it's eliminating cigarettes. And I was just, uh, just approved in the uh, US by the FDA for sale. And their goal is to get out of the cigarette business eliminate the cigarette business completely, which is quite a bold statement. And again, it's a controversial one, but I think it was a, a very interesting play to see how do we basically get out of the business we are currently in completely. And I think it's a very bold move. And something that you have to do in times of abundance, you know, you can't stress this enough to businesses that if you make those decisions in times of scarcity, you're going to hang on to that revenue at all costs. How do you see this play out with the businesses you work with? The challenge these days is, and it, it, this is actually a later lens we might not have a chance to get to, but there's the real business lens. And I think that is when you think about uh, what is a really incredibly powerful lens, that to me is one of the most powerful ones because the real business lens says, what business am I really in? Like Kodak, were they in the film business or were they in the capturing and sharing moments business. And if you think you're in one business and the world changes, like film went to digital, well, then it, it doesn't really, it doesn't help you very much because uh, you're, you're going to be focusing on the wrong problem. So I think making sure we're asking the right questions around our business, our industry, am I in the tobacco industry? Am I in the cigarette business? These are all important questions. And Every company needs to be questioning what business they're in because there's new competition that's always going to challenge it. And there's always going to be shifts in buyer behaviors that are going to impact whether or not people want or desire your products. And a great way, a lens you help us to do this with is the hyponym lens. We have to use more specific words. And you give the great example of the word move earlier. You talk about in the book about how to move a heavy item and changing the language here can give you a totally different result. I think it's first important to define what we mean by a hyponym. We know what a synonym is. A synonym is a word that is of the same level of abstraction. Uh, so they're similar. They're basically words that have the same meaning. A hyponym means that it is something that is reduced abstraction. It's something that's more specific than the original one. So the word move, if you were to look at some of the hyponyms for move, uh, and I provide some dictionaries where you can do this. There's spread, carry, float, glide, fly, push, roll, and ski. 
And so if you take one of those, instead of saying, how do I move a heavy item? Uh, maybe I'm going to, how do I spread the heavy item? Which then means, well, we're, we're increasing the surface area, which might impact the pounds per square inch. Or how do we glide it? Well, if we're going to glide it, that means that we need to somehow reduce the friction. So each of those words are going to open up a new range of possible solutions. Uh, and it, sometimes synonyms can do that. I mean, so just changing one word can have a huge impact on the possible solutions. And I was really struck by this throughout the book is the power of language because it really frames our thinking and it becomes so important even from a creative writing perspective. But moving on to the next section, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 are all about increasing abstraction when the problem is too specific because it's almost the opposite of the last section. Now, we won't have time to explore them all, but let's share the goal of this phase and then perhaps just one of the lenses. I picked one out and it's mainly for the corporate innovators who are listening today. And this is the concern reframe lens because this one's so important because so many businesses experience a doctor no and the team, someone who says, we tried that before. Yeah. So, so first of all, the, this, this category of lenses is about increasing abstraction. This is when we're asking a question that's too specific, too narrowly defined, or as is the case quite often as a solution masquerading as a question. So a lot of times we ask questions, but they're really answers framed as questions. And so, uh, what we need to do is figure out a way of increasing the abstraction. So they're less specific. Uh, for example, uh, the analogy lens, uh, is the one that was used for the Exxon Valdez. What is it like? Who else has solved a similar problem? And if you think about that, well, who else has solved the problem of uh, viscous shearing? Well, that was increasing the abstraction at some level. Uh, the concern reframe is a super simple one, and it's one that I really like because what ends up happening is you're in a meeting, uh, and inevitably somebody will say, we don't have enough money, or we don't have enough time. And the concern reframe basically says, how do we take a statement, how do we take a concern and reframe it as a new opportunity, a new question? So instead of saying, you know, we don't have enough time, all good questions start with how can we? So how can we do it in less time? How can we uh, find the time? If it's about money, instead of saying we don't have enough money, it's like, how can we do it for less money? How can we... Uh, raise the money? How can we partner with someone so that it doesn't cost us any money and we give them a share of what we create? Every statement, every belief, every assumption that we have is really just an opportunity if we take the time to reframe it and flip it around. You mentioned their analogy, and I thought this one was really interesting because I'm a huge fan, as you are, of diversity of thought, neurodiversity within teams and mixing different industries and how in innovation happens at the intersections. Mm -hmm. And this kind of sparked this idea to me that if we look for someone else who may have solved the problem we have, we can come up with new ideas. And a great example I wanted to share with you was one I heard where it was a team looking for an IoT, Internet of Things, solution to solve when pollution was happening. They shared this problem with a biomarine team. And one of the biomarine team suggested that actually, you know what opens when there's pollution in the water are muscles. So the actual muscles open up and that actually can tell you that there's pollution in the water. And I thought it was a great example of bringing two strains or two disciplines together to come up with a new solution using the analogy frame. Biomimicry is a great one. I mean, gas pipeline engineers, one of the challenges they face is pipelines crack, break and leak. So they talk to cardiologists to understand the way the body operates and how do you seal cracks. So if you get a paper cut, you don't need stitches. You don't have to go to the doctor. It seals itself. And so using what you were just describing, biomimicry, which is how can a business understand what happens in you know the world of biology, well, that's fascinating. And I think all those analogies open up some huge, huge opportunities. In fact, one of my strongly held beliefs is any problem you're working on, any problem, if you ask a question that's two words, you will find a solution eventually. And the two words are, who else? Who else has solved a similar problem? Not the same problem, but a similar problem in a different area of expertise. It could be in biology. It could be in a different industry. It could be in a different area of expertise. But asking that who else question is so powerful. It's the, the fastest way to find at least the kernel of a solution that you can use for any problem. And just while we mentioned language, because you mentioned uh, hyponym, but in this category, you also have hypernym. 
we, maybe we should share that one as well to complete that circle. Sure. So hyponym means to reduce the abstraction, make it more specific. Hypernym means to raise it up. Uh, so to me, the, the simplest example of this is uh, if you think about a, a, a poodle or a dog, a chihuahua, well, the hypernym of that would be dog and the hypernym of dog would be animal. And so you can keep on going up and each of those open things open up your opportunity. So if you went to a shelter and you had your heart set on a chihuahua uh, and there are no chihuahuas, you're going to leave empty handed. But if you open up your mind and say, well, I want a dog or I want an animal, I'd be open to a cat or a ferret. Well, that changes things. And so one of the examples that I like uh, is a relatively recent one, which is uh, the second largest producer of uh, chicken in the United States is Tyson. And they've always thought of themselves as a as a meat company uh, because that's what they did. They had meat, that chicken was their main thing, but they had other meats. And they decided they're going to become a protein company. Protein is a, a hypernym for meat. And if you think about what that opens up, well, meat implies that it comes from an animal, but protein doesn't necessarily come from an animal. And they've now launched uh, a couple of new different business lines focused around uh, animal-free protein-based shrimp and other types of proteins that have nothing to do with animal meat, but are actually based on other, uh, other types of um, materials. So I, I think it's really interesting is if you think you're a meat company, you're going to be thinking about cattle and chicken and pork and things of that nature. Changing the one word opens up a whole new range of opportunities. I love this because if your organization then are all engaged in this, they'll all become sensors for our spotting opportunities. And then you can bring those ideas back to base. And we'll, we'll cover that at the end because we don't want, as you say in the book, way too much of a quantity of ideas. We want quality ideas from the quantity. But let's jump on to the next five lenses. And these ones are all about changing perspective to help us consider their challenge with brand new eyes. Just five different ways to look at a problem. One is the resequence lens, which is about the timing. A lot of times we'll have a problem statement that implies something has to happen before something else, or it has to happen after something else. But what if we predicted, instead of waiting till we have all the information, what if we predicted and forecasted what's going to happen? Or what if instead of predicting, we postponed and we waited till we had all the information? What if we did things in parallel? So the timing and sequency can be really important. There's the reassign lens, which is about who does the work. Uh, and then there's a couple of others, access, emotion, and substitute, which are just uh, these are all different ways to take the problem statement and look at it from a different angle to get a different range of solutions. One of the ones I just love to hone in on is access because people have heard of the access economy, but may not entirely understand what that frame means. And I think it's so helpful the way you articulate this in the book. A lot of times we will use words that imply ownership. Like we have to have it as something which is, you know, back in the days you might own a DVD or you might own a CD, or if you want to go back, you might own an LP. Uh, and then you could own tracks. You could go into iTunes and you could buy a song, but you still owned it. Of course, now in the world of music, a lot of people are going towards Spotify and things of that nature where you are renting it. You are getting access to it. You're able to play it without actually owning it. And there's some fascinating examples of this. One of my favorite examples is actually not, I mean, it's very easy to think about these things in the digital world, but the physical world, we tend not to think of it quite as much. One of my favorite examples is a, a, a company called Freedom Boat Club. And the Freedom Boat Club basically gives you access to the water. Instead of buying a boat, you get a subscription and subscription is a form of access you get a subscription to boats. And it's not just one boat, but it's many boats. And it's not like you just have a limited amount of access. You have unlimited access. You only have a limited number of reservations. And actually, when I lived in Boston, a friend of mine had this membership. And it was great because we were on boats all the time. She only got two reservations. So once one reservation was used, she could make another reservation. So they managed the capacity the utilization through reservations, but we had unlimited access. So you can give people access to even physical items uh, the same way you do with like Spotify if you're very clever about it. I thought about this one deeply from a business perspective. So from a disruption perspective and businesses having their eyes open for what's coming down the line, the edge behaviors we're starting to see. And one of these things is these connected services by car companies. For example, subscription programs are starting to open and businesses who are involved in cars and car manufacture, et cetera, needs to totally rethink 
What does that mean for them as a result of this access lens? Well, absolutely. I mean, if you think about it in some respects, I mean, Uber is a form of access. We've got access to someone else's car and someone else driving us. And so that's a, a form of access. You don't have to own a car because you can now have access to a car. Uh, as cars, especially when we get to the, uh, and, and there's even uh, car, uh, peer-to-peer types of environments for car rentals. So I have a car in my driveway. It sits there 90% of the time. What if I gave somebody access to it? So there are versions of that. Uh, and then once we get into autonomous vehicles, there's going to be the point where you basically on your phone, push a button, a car shows up in your driveway, you get to hop in it and it takes you wherever you want to go. So all, and that's why the, the, the real business lens is so important is because if you think you are in the business of just selling cars and you are selling them to individuals, uh, that might be shifting. Maybe we're no longer selling cars to houses and individuals, but we're selling them to brokers. We're selling them to drivers. We're selling them to uh, others who actually manage the whole flow of the cars, but they're not, they're owned in fleets rather than by individuals. So understanding your industry is so important. The next five lenses then are about switching elements, particularly the flip lens. I love this. This is where you solve for a different factor. And you alluded to this one earlier on. I loved the example you gave, the whiskey glass to glass diameter challenge. So all these switching elements basically says, instead of solving for this, we're going to solve for that. And the baggage claim example, instead of speeding up the bags, we're going to slow down the passengers. Anytime there's multiple parameters, instead of solving for the one you thought was the problem, solve for the other one. Uh, the, 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 the example that you're referring to is one, uh, a client of mine has a bar that is a uh, whiskey bar. That's what they're known for. And I'm a, I'm a scotch drinker and I like to drink it neat. That's me. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you drink whiskey, uh, and you're somebody who likes it with rocks with ice, you want, uh, to have it as a sphere, not as a cube. Uh, and the reason is the sphere has the lowest surface area, so it will melt the slowest. So it's not watering down your whiskey. And the other key thing is to make sure that the, the ratio between the ice sphere and the glass is just perfect. And so this one bar, the challenge they had was because of their glasses, they needed two and a half inch ice spheres to have the ice be the perfect ratio. And they were spending $30,000 a year uh, basically trying to manufacture these, these ice spheres, buying, the, buying basically two and a half inch ice cubes and then manually shaving them down into spheres was very expensive. Now they could do two inch ice cubes, ice spheres for free because there were molds, but there were no two and a half inch ice molds that would allow them to do this. So they were trying to solve the problem. How do we produce these two and a half inch ice spheres for less than $30,000? And they weren't getting anywhere. And then somebody had the interesting epiphany, the, the interesting realization, which was, well, instead of trying to focus on the ice, what if we focused on the glass? And they basically replaced the glasses with slightly smaller glasses so that the two inch ice spheres would work. They didn't spend any money on ice anymore and they had the perfect ratio. So we can solve for one problem versus another problem. And again, these seem simple when they're already solved, but when you're so attached to a way of doing things, it's very difficult to get outside, which is what the lens does. It gets, it helps you get outside your own head and see it from a totally different perspective. One of the ones I love, and it's a real tenet of innovation is conflicts, solving conflicts where it's not this or that, but it can be this and that. And I love the example you gave here, which is Dulux. So there's a number of products that do this. I actually was just in the store the other day and there was a spackle for patching holes and walls that does the same thing. And the problem is if you are painting a white ceiling uh, with white paint, well, you don't know if you missed spots. And so it could be uneven. And then when it dries, it looks terrible. So the, you know, the, the challenge was how do we uh, you know, paint white on white, yet be able to see it. And the solution that they came up with was, well, it's going to roll on pink. They, when the paint goes on the ceiling, it is actually pink in color. And as it dries, it turns white. And so they solve that problem, that paradoxical problem of the conflict of white on white by changing the color and having it adapt eventually. So I think that's a really, you know, it's a very powerful one. Conflicts are, we look at conflicts, we look at constraints as being bad when it comes to innovation, but I actually think conflicts and constraints are 
the key to driving some of the greatest innovations. The other kind of paradox you mentioned is performance paradox. This is where we need to shift the focus if we're having issues hitting a certain goal, changing what's measured, for example. I love this one. This is a, I actually worked in motorsports for a number of years when I lived in the UK, worked for a, a race car team. And I remember having a conversation with one of the guys there, and I was always fascinated with the pit crews. And the short version of the story is that you get pit crews to go faster by telling them to go fast. And they do it over and over and over and over and over. Uh, but there's a point where they can't go any faster. And what they found was the way that they could actually get them to go faster is to tell them that they weren't going to be measured on their speed, but rather on their style. So as they're changing the tires, as they're doing maintenance on the car, whatever their, their role is in the pit crew, they were to think smooth. And they were going to be evaluated on the smoothness of their movements. And they were to go fast, but they were to go smooth. And interestingly, when they were focused not on speed, but rather on style and smoothness, they went faster. And this to me is the paradox is we sometimes push our teams, we push our people to go faster and faster and faster. Yet there is a point of diminishing returns. And what we need to do is back off and recognize that that increased stress actually reduces performance. So that performance paradox is basically sometimes the best way to to hit the goal is to not focus on the goal. And the reason why I love this particular lens is because it is the whole point of the book. Sometimes the best way to find a solution to your problem is to not focus on the solution, but rather to step back and focus on the question or the problem. And that to me is the, really the key of the book. So I think there's a very powerful lens from a whole variety of perspectives. And then the last category, the last five lenses are all about zeroing in on the opportunity. And you've referred to the real business lens, but let's share perhaps the overall goal of these and then maybe your favorite out of these five. The five lenses are the real problems lens, making sure we're solving the right problem. The real business lens means, are we in the business we think we're in? The insights lens, which is basically around making sure we have the data. Because if we if we don't have the right data, if we don't have the right insights, we might be solving the wrong problem. Then there's the observation lens. And the observation lens is, well, sometimes data can fall short of giving us real insights. So maybe we need to use ethnography and observe our customers. And then there's the variations lens. And the variations lens basically says, don't design for a one-size-fits-all solution. And so if, if you ask me my favorite of those, I think they're all incredibly important, but the variations lens has yielded some really, really incredibly powerful solutions. And I actually learned about this lens about 30 years ago when I was a computer programmer. And I remember my boss said, designed to handle the exception, not for the exception. And I remember what I was doing is I was basically creating complex code for the exception that was so complex that it bogged down all the other standard processes. But if we design to handle those exceptions, not for them, we now create multiple variations of the process. Uh, if you think about, for example, uh, you know, claims processing for an insurance company, if you design to handle the exception, which is the complex play, claim, then every single claim is going to be handled in a very cumbersome, long manner. But if you design to handle the exception, you might assume that most claims are simple. In fact, one company did this, 60% of their claims were super duper simple. So they just had a, a generalist, uh, a lower paid person who was able to basically take it, process it, boom, it's done, 60% of them done. And then the really complex ones needed specialists, but they didn't have specialists on everything. So that variations, as I think, is so powerful to recognize that sometimes the best solutions aren't one size fits all, but rather are designed to deal with each situation uniquely. The last section of the book is about creating a culture of innovation by leveraging questions and challenges. You start this section by sharing how many idea crowdsourcing and initiatives fail and how that can actually demotivate businesses and people within the business. And oftentimes businesses suffer from what is called mob sourcing. I want to be clear. I'm a huge fan of crowdsourcing when it's done right. Uh, and it really comes back to the question. If you think about most crowdsourcing, the questions we ask are big, broad, and abstract. So we might use a suggestion box mentality uh, where we ask our employees, our customers, our partners, you know, how can we improve the business? Now, if I ask a question like that, I'm pretty much guaranteed to get thousands of ideas of which maybe two will be valuable. Uh, so 
it's it's not so much that crowdsourcing is bad, but the way it is typically implemented because of the questions that are asked doesn't work. And mob sourcing is basically says that people are going to choose, if, if we allow people to vote, people are going to choose solutions that actually serve their own personal interests rather than necessarily the greater interests of the entire company. There are four steps you identify to the metaphorical innovation funnel, and they are conception, submission, elimination, and selling. They are absolutely key. I'd love if you took us through these four steps. So if we come back to that suggestion box mentality, where we say, give us your ideas, opinions, and suggestions, there are these four steps that you mentioned. So what, the first step is the, the conception. We conceive the idea. So we're sitting around and we're thinking, oh man, there's got to be a better way to do this. And we come up with the idea and it pops into our head, but it's just a thought. We don't do anything with it, but just a thought. And then at some point we need to submit it, which means we have to take the time to actually submit it into the idea management system or into the suggestion box or whatever tools are being used. Now we're increasing the amount of time. So conceiving an idea, that's just sort of a thought bubble. Submission means we're taking more time to actually write it down. The elimination means what we're going to do is say we're going to eliminate the ones that don't work. Uh, and from my experience, and based on a number of different studies out there, uh, on average, 99 to 99.9% of ideas that are submitted don't get implemented. So that means we spend a lot of time thinking about the problem, submitting the problem, and eliminating the problem. And then eventually, once we get the solution, the idea that we like, we need to sell it. And unfortunately, things still fall off the cliff during this step because you need to find somebody. I, I've got this great idea, a new way of doing something. Now I've got to sell it to somebody inside the company. And if nobody inside the company who has money is interested in it, it dies. And so this is the traditional way of working is we basically have created 99.9% .9 waste of the time thought about thinking about the problem, submitting the problem, evaluating the problem, and selling the problem. And it creates such a low level of value for the organization. And it creates frustration for the people who are submitting. There's something called idea fatigue. Idea fatigue is where people keep on submitting ideas, getting rejected, submitting ideas, getting rejected. And this happens over and over and over. And I've seen an Every company that I've worked with, idea fatigue sets in at some point, and then they need to shift to something else. Yeah, so frustrating. And I work in innovation work and organizational development like you do. And one of the most frustrating things is when you do a workshop or you do some work with a client, and it's a big splash and everybody's excited and engaged, and then nothing's done with the work. Maybe it's a paper or a business model or whatever and it's put in a desk and nothing's ever done with it. And so demotivating for the people who have worked on it, who saw this as a glimmer of hope for the future of the organization. And here you share your CCI approach and your fast innovation process, because these are ways you can see to overcome these challenges. CCI is challenge-centered innovation. And basically what it means is instead of centering the work around ideas, we're going to center our work around the question. And if you think about it, with suggestion boxes, idea-centered innovation, uh, basically each idea is evaluated on its own merits, how complicated it's going to be to implement, how much value is it going to create, where is it going to get housed, who's going to support it. We need to get the funding and the resources and all of that. With challenge-centered innovation, we flip the whole thing on its head. We start with it a question, an important question, a well-framed question, something that if we solved, it would move the needle for the organization. But before we start asking for solutions to that question, we define the evaluation criteria. How will we know when we have a good solution? This allows us to be objective in the evaluation process. We also have evaluators identified up front who have context, who will then be able to make some of the best decisions. But equally important, we have sponsors, owners, and funding uh, and all the resources necessary identified up front. So we don't have to sell it. We don't have to go through the whole process that we went through previously, where the great ideas that actually did get submitted wither on the vine. We know this is something we need to solve. We've got the executive support. We've got the financial support. We've got the resources lined up. And now we move forward. And when I've worked with companies applying this challenge-centered innovation approach, uh, one of my clients who measures everything found that compared to their idea-driven innovation pro approach, 
it was driving a minimum of a tenfold improvement in ROI because they eliminated all the wasted energy. They eliminated all the time spent on things that were low value. They were only focused on things that created high value and the implementation was faster because everything was lined up beforehand. Because once they found a solution that met their evaluation criteria, they started to work on it. And it doesn't mean that you don't have ideas. You know, sometimes I, I, I come across as ideas are horrible and you should never do it. And that's not really the case. You want both, but you want to have the right balance. And the challenges should be in the forefront and the ideas should be in the background, not the other way around, which is how most companies do it. That's the CCI approach. And then you explain your fast FAST innovation process as well. It's great to get a top line of what that is. And so FAST stands for Focus, Ask, Shift, Test. Uh, and it's really key components of challenge-centered innovation. Focus means when you're asking questions, focus on the areas which are going to have the greatest impact. And from my perspective, those are your differentiators, the reasons why people do business with you. So I say innovate where you differentiate. You can't be the best at everything. If you do, you'll be the best at nothing, and therefore focus your energies on those differentiators. Uh, the ask is what we've been talking about. How do we ask better questions uh, as a means of driving better solutions? And there's a in the book I talk about the places to look for those questions. The S is the shift, which is about shifting your mindset. This is where we find solutions. Uh, and in order to shift our mindset, we need to ask that who else question that we talked about before. Uh, look elsewhere to find the solutions. Because one of the things we know is when people are cut from the same cloth, when we are, like if I'm working on a sales problem, if I ask a hundred salespeople to solve a sales problem and I'm not getting a solution, adding the hundred and first salesperson will not make one bit of difference. But if we add somebody from marketing and product development and maybe somebody from you know biology, well, maybe we're gonna find an interesting solution we hadn't considered. And then the last part of this, and I think this is really important, is the T in the fast, which is test. These days, everybody is talking about failure, like failure is a good thing. If we aren't failing, we aren't innovating. And look, I think we've over glorified innovation. I think we've taken failure to the point of absurdity. Failure is an inevitable outcome. It is not the desired outcome. So what we need to do is become masters at experimentation. And if we become really good at experimentation, we'll be able to test our hypotheses, reducing the risk of failure. And to be clear, if you have a hypothesis, I believe this is a great idea, and you run an experiment and you test it out, and it proves it is not a great idea, that is not failure. From the perspective of experimentation, that was a successful experiment. Where failure happens is, I have an idea, I have a solution that actually is not good. It will fail. I run an experiment on it, and my experiment, for whatever reason, tells me, hey, this is a great idea. Then I move forward. That's failure. The experiment failed to give you the correct insights. So failure is not the goal. Failure happens, but we want to mitigate it as much as we can. Beautiful. And one of the ways you used the lenses on yourself was when you were writing a book and you asked yourself a question, which is, what do I want to do here? And it led to building this platform and the book and a podcast that's on the way. Where can people find out more about the book, the platform, the podcast? So the easiest place is just to go to InvisibleSolutionsBook.com. That's InvisibleSolutionsBook.com. There are videos there where I tell the entire baggage claim story. There's a whole bunch of other videos which might be of interest to you. So there's a lot of good free stuff that you can get there also author of Invisible Solutions, 25 Lenses That Reframe and Help Solve Difficult Business Problems, Stephen Shapiro, thank you for joining us. Oh, it was my pleasure. This was great. <laughs>